No problem at all. That's perfect. But uh, Matthew, thanks for coming on. Uh, we finally got a date and a time arranged, so it's uh, it's a pleasure to finally talk to you and to meet you. Hey, uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing to be able to do over the phone now to be able to chat with someone from Scotland about a shared interest. It's great. Yeah, te- technology it gets shunned a lot these days, but it is absolutely brilliant for some things and the fact that you can connect with people all across the world so yeah. so really it's pretty cool but uh, no thank you for coming on we had a time day arrange I think before we had to keep changing it we're, we're obviously extremely busy the two of us but uh, you're here now we're going to talk about all things music um, we're mm-hmm. going to talk about your influences songwriting playing gigs yeah. everything in between uh, before we get started though Matthew how are you actually doing? I'm all good. Hey, I'm good. As I was saying to you there, I'm, uh, I'm in a car here for anyone that's listening and anyone that's watching. So um, I my own car broke down yesterday, so I've just been going over and back trying to get parts all day today. So if anybody out there listening has an alternator going, I'll take it. No bother. <laughs> that's fine. Uh, but what I'm doing, Matthew, is a good starting point is just going back to the very beginning. Yeah. So I normally ask people, uh, first of all, where were you brought up? Where did you grow up? So I am from uh, a county, or County Donegal here in the Republic of Ireland. So um, for anybody that is aware of it, obviously we have a lot of ties to Scotland as well, the areas in the Scottish, but um, we're the most northerly county where I am. I'm actually up near the most northerly point on uh, in Ireland, so I'm up near Malin Head. Right. I'm from a wee town called Kildaff. So Kildaff is a very small rural wee fishing village and do you know what, it's... I wouldn't change it for the world. I wouldn't go anywhere else. I love it. Yeah, that's great. And uh, I know, obviously, your dad has um, in, been in the music industry. So mm-hmm. normally I would ask people, were you into music growing up? I, I know that you've obviously got that influence from a very young age Yeah, from your dad. But um, what, sort of, what sort of stuff was your dad? Uh, what influences was your dad having on you when you were growing up music-wise? Do you know, it's very strange. When I grew up, um, I was very aware that the music I was listening to was written by dad. Yeah. So, like, I, I've been aware that he was a songwriter from a very, very young age. Um, so, like, he used to have, and this is for how back far it was, it was, do you know, when we had tapes, cassettes. <laughs> yeah. So, I remember I used to have the cassette, and I used to be just recording and rewinding the whole time. And, so growing up, I was always very aware that, and dad stuff would kind of been like singer songwriter, kind of American country, middle of the road t- towards American country, um, kind of writing. Um, and as he's gotten older now, it's kind of, it's just kind of more. Well, I suppose there is a massive country element too, but they're kind of like country songs with a, uh, with the kind of middle of the road kind of modern writing kind of thing. But we, we growing up, modern, that, modern twist but, on it. Yeah, exactly. So, like, growing up, he was constantly introducing me to, um, like, I think I must have listened to the Pancho and Lefty album, Willie Nelson, and all with, I say I've listened to that about, uh, must over two or three thousand times now. Um, and then, like, I was big into Merritt Haggard. He started getting me into Chris Christopherson, and uh, just kind of towards the end of that stage, you know, every person will have that thing with their dad where, there's a point where your dad tells you something and you can't wait to check it out. And then your dad tells you there's something you're like, ah, dad, that's not cool. <laughs> but just before, before I got to that point where he was just, where I thought the stuff he was showing me was uncool, he just introduced me to Rod Stewart. Um, and particularly he introduced me to I Don't Want to Talk About It, right. which funnily enough, that song has kind of come with me now through my whole life. And, um, but basically like, I was very heavily influenced with the American country stuff growing up. Then, as well as that, um, in Donegal here, we have, I don't know if it's the same with yourselves, but predominantly have we have one kind of local radio station. Right. And for us, that was, or for that, us, that is Highland Radio, which is like our community radio. And basically, whatever was being played on Highland Radio was what I was listening to. Do you know, this was before streaming and before... Facebook and all that kind of stuff. So you were just getting things in from the community that were like on the radio. So then that was over here, um, Irish country music, such a big thing. So that was kind of, I was always in and around that world as well because that was what dad did and then it was on the radio. And um, so that's just kind of been my my upbringing so far. Yeah, obviously that a huge big sort of musical influence from your dad. 
Was there an age that you got to where you sort of discovered your your own musical taste that was different from your dad? So, for example, mm. uh, I was speaking with um, I had early from Pete and Diesel. I don't know if you've heard of them. No, I haven't. I haven't heard of that. Either. They're a really really big band um, from Scotland. That they're, they're becoming really 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 big, and they they're from up in Stornoway. You okay. know, so probably similar to yourself, you know, kind of shielded a wee bit from, you know, the rest of the world almost, you know, but yeah. heavily into like the tra- traditional Scottish music. But I always remember him saying that he got to a certain age and he discovered, for him it was Oasis. That he mm. dis- was there something like that for yourself, like a band that you discovered that wasn't something that your dad had introduced you, something that was just your own? Definitely, um, like at that age, I was just coming into being maybe 12, 13, 14, um, just when mobile phones were starting to get advanced. Yep. You could start getting music on your phone and um, you could, I remember having my first iPod and stuff. Um, and for me, now anybody that's listened to this might laugh, but there were two kind of main influences, or two, not influences, but two main kind of things when I got to that point were number one, I do see those balloons. I think it's because you're, you're doing that. <laughs> I know, yeah, I was wondering what, what that was. Um, but, uh, so, first one was, and for anybody that's listening to this and might have a laugh, but um, it was Taylor Swift, would you believe, because yeah. she she was doing, at that time she was doing the country thing, but she was doing it with a, it was, it was near enough pop, do you know what I mean? It, it was like, it was so well produced and the songs were so well written that um, I can't remember what they are. Like it was the love, the area era of love story and stuff like that, and Hey Stephen and um, all that kind of stuff was just the songwriting aspect of that was different from anything that I'd heard. You know, um, partly because you're hearing songs from a, a woman's point of view, mm-hmm. um, and secondly because you're hearing like a different production style than you would have normally heard. So that was one thing that definitely stuck out to me, and then. Complete polar opposite then was um, Nickelback, which was a strange one. Right. Okay. Um, and I remember, I remember the first first CD I ever bought, and this is one everybody always talks about. But I remember buying um, Snow Patrol uh, CD. Um, I could tell you the cover now, but I couldn't tell you what the name of it was. It was like a really multicolored cover. I'm, I'm almost sure it was the time of chasing cars and stuff, but. That was, even then, that was what was being played on the radio here, so that wasn't too far away, do you know what I mean? Um, but I remember giving my iPod, whenever I got the iPod, you know the way it used to be in phones, that it was whatever was on your laptop went on to the... Yeah. So I remember giving my iPod to my friend and his brothers had obviously were older than us, they were maybe 16, 17, so they had this whole wealth of music. So that was when I was just kind of discovering stuff. And I remember that was when I first kind of discovered Nickelback, and that was, you know, a, he- a lot heavier than anything I had listened to. Yeah. Um, and it's, funny, it's funny that you mentioned those two acts, though, because the one thing that they've actually both got in common, although they're very different, is you've got the the one um, Taylor Swift with the countryside, and yeah. then Nickelback, but they both had the ability to make it very commercial. Yes. I don't mean that in a bad way, but um, rather than it being this sort of underground sound that's very niche to this particular yeah. crowd, they brought it to the masses. You know, they just managed to tweak it enough that it, it, they could get it on the radio. Yeah, and I think that is very, very important to note that, especially at that age, whenever, like, do you know what's funny? A lot of people will have, like, a musical identity, and they'll be like, you know, they'll always, like some people will be dead against something Yeah. just from the start. I've never actually had that. Like, so if something is in any way just sounds like even sonically sounds nice, even if it's instrumental, I've always just taken to it. Yeah. Um, so for me, like the production aspect of stuff has always been a massive, massive aspect of stuff. So like, it doesn't really matter who it is. If it's well recorded, well produced, sounds warm. Yeah. I mean, I think sometimes... People, uh, uh, I think there's a lot of people maybe a bit sort of uh, snobby as mm. in they're stuck in one sort of thing. I mean, don't get me wrong, that there's, there's certain styles of music I prefer yeah. over 
over other ones, but to me, a, a good song's a good song. And it, it's just as simple as that, really. Yeah. You, it doesn't matter who's wrote it. I can listen to it, and if it's if it's a good song, you know it's a good song. Yeah, that's one hundred percent. Like, and I only I only started really getting into the songwriting aspect of things as I got a bit older, but just. For my just for my context and stuff of where I came from, it was very much a country background, and then I discovered like this Taylor Swift stuff. Like it was the same. I remember like if you want to push on about it even more from there, I remember the first time I heard Jack Johnson. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you know, uh, yeah. like he had that um, song "Better Together," and that was just like then my personality changed. I went, I was just purely into Jack Johnson, and then after Jack Johnson, it went towards Jason Mraz because. Just Mraz had just came out with I'm Yours at that time and that whole aspect then was but it all kind of correlated into when I was learning guitar so yeah. like that's why that kind of genre of music became popular to me and I think that's the same with a lot of people like you you listen to what you play like do you know what I mean and yeah. I actually started learning music on a piano and could not get the hang of the piano at all well it um, was the, it was guitar your first instrument but it was piano Piano was my, so my dad plays um, piano, piano and keyboard and stuff. And I thought, right, if dad does it, I'll go and I'll hopefully pick it up. But um, it just wasn't for me. And I, I, I'm i 29 now and I wish that I had a kept at it because it's such a, like, I see people just sit down at a piano and I'd be so jealous. Like, I can play a bit like and I can accompany myself to sing. But, like, to sit down and be able to play a piano properly would be... But so it was piano first, and then um, I've just, like, I wouldn't, uh, that's another thing, I wouldn't call myself a guitar player. Like, you right. know, I'm not, I'm not a, a by any means, uh, like, a good, or I'm an average guitar player at best. Well, you don't have to be, I think that's another, another mistake that a lot of people can make. You, you don't need to be a technically gifted guitarist or whatever instrument it is you're playing, but let's say guitar, you don't need to be technically gifted to write an outstanding song. Yeah, and fa- and you know, I'm going to make the argument, no, there are obviously exceptions, I'm going to make the argument that it's nearly better to be kind of, not completely basic, but once you can, like, especially in terms of songwriting, it's always the simple stuff that does well. Do you know what I mean? Like, and I mean in terms of, like, for math listening ability. Um, like, if you were, now obviously, if you're a musician like myself, you could sit down and like, listen to Jacob Collier's new album and have your mind absolutely blown by chords and harmony and melody that you would never even think of doing. But it's when you sit down, like, some of the stuff that I write has all come from melodies that I can own, that were only written because I could barely play, if you know yeah. what I mean. I mean, the, 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 the great example of that, especially being, um, you know, where we are in the world, you know, I, I'm unfortunately a little bit older than yourself, but I, I was I, I was brought up, I was a teenager right bang in the 90s. Yeah. And the biggest example of that was the biggest band of, of the UK, which was Oasis, yeah. you know. And they would, you know, no Gallagher writing the songs, he would be the first person to tell you you know he's not technically gifted. Yeah. You know he's not he's not the best guitar player in the world, but he would probably argue that he's one of the best songwriters in the world. Yeah. Yeah, and this you see, it was one of those. They were one of those bands that I completely ignored throughout my youth because I liked the the heavy rock stuff. So I was almost ignorant, as in, you know, it's too simple. You know, I like the technical stuff, and then obviously. As you get older, you you kind of go back and you rediscover things, and yeah. you know, listening to some of their stuff. I'm I'm not a big fan, but there's no denying it's like the song, the amount of songs that they that they wrote that just appealed to the masses, and they're not tricky, difficult songs, but they've got a hook, they've got something that just catches people's attention, and yeah. uh, and I, I I think he's seen it. He said in an interview when they were talking about his lyrics, you know. Because sometimes he'll, he'll maybe be uh, discredited for, you know, his lyrics aren't very good or that. But as he says, well, people will say, what does this mean? And he says, I don't know what it means, but I don't need to know what it means. Because when I'm on stage and there's 50,000 people singing the song back at you, 
all I know is that it means something to the 50,000 people singing it back to you. Exactly. Exactly. It's all. Who's wrong? Yeah, exactly. Like, it just shows you, like, that's the thing about music as well. Because music is subjective, um, yeah. what, you, what you intend something to be can be misconstrued and taken and take on a full new meaning to someone else. Yeah. And I think that's, like, a, a really good characteristic of a good song good songwriter and stuff like like that's something I'm only becoming more and more aware of now obviously I'm from the other realm of the kind of the country stuff where the country stuff is just bang on like it it says exactly what it means to say and that's what yeah. it's built itself around but like I would completely agree I never got into Oasis even to this day I'm not madly into Oasis but you cannot deny like they defined a generation. Do you know what I mean? And uh, like they, they have just they're the soundtrack for a generation as well. Like they always will be, and th like that's phenomenal. Like if you were to think of that for yourself personally and be like, I am, um, I am the voice of a generation or the lad. I know they might not speak, but like to be sitting and going, oh, me and the brother were the gener, like we're the voice of a generation. It's phenomenal and it just shows you as well how important like music is and stuff for uh, just for that kind of stuff for time and for you know for how people relate and as you, the weird thing about Oasis is now I see from gigging as much as well is that it's not just defined to that generation younger people are coming through and are as into it as they were years ago so like yeah. you could see you might see a very unlikely pairing and at a gig or a bar where like it's one guy in the corner and then someone a lot younger and the minute you play like Wonderwall or Don't Look Back in Anger, they just click. Do you know what I mean? It just makes me feel feel old now that that's thirty years ago. <laughs> Aye, I know. Oh. That, that's that's my own issue. But uh, Matthew, so you obviously had a wee shot at the piano, wasn't for yourself, switched over to the guitar. Yeah. What about your singing? When did the singing come into it? So the singing has been, to quote my family, the singing has been there from almost when I could talk. Like, um, Mum and dad would often say that, like, that I was singing before I was talking because obviously when you're listening, you're just mimicking back. So I had no idea what I was saying, but I, like, I was singing from a really, really young age. And then it's just... I think being that age, singing, and I live in a very rural area as well. So, and I was I was brought up in a farming background. So I was singing every day, just doing something. Right. So you know, I could have been out working on the tractor and just there's no radio, so I'm just yeah. singing away. Or like my aunt, which is a quite kind of funny story, but for my the kind of thing that's sticking with me from the singing is that I have a very strong, like a very loud voice, very powerful voice. But my aunt always tells a story about like how my dad was heading over to get a bale of silage in a tractor and I was behind him in a wee engine scooter, a wee blue engine, like two stroke pe petrol scooter. And yeah. I was singing obviously with the helmet on that covered my mouth, singing the top of my lungs and she could still make me out. Yeah. Clear as day over a tractor. So singing has just been there. I would say genuinely it's been there since I was about four or five, maybe younger. Um, that, that, that's the one thing most people it's almost the last thing. So, you know, everybody learns their instrument and then it's yeah. who's brave enough to step in front of the microphone with yourself. It sounds almost like you're probably at home with it when it comes to singing and it's more your confidence might take a wee dip when it's the guitar. I, I don't yeah. think, but, but, you know, when you're obviously, I mean, you say probably you're more confident with singing over anything else. Definitely in the last couple of years, yeah. Yeah. Um, like before, when I when I was younger, I would have been very uncomfortable singing without the guitar. Right. So, like, even if I was playing something like on on a stage or on a show that I wasn't physically playing the guitar on, I would have mimed just because it was like whenever you're thinking about the hand, you're not thinking about the singing, so the singing yeah. comes more effortlessly. But definitely, in the last couple of years, now I'm starting to I'm starting to feel really at home in the singing. Um, like I used to have. I definitely used to compare myself a lot to other people and and their singing ability. And then it's funny, you know, the minute you stop doing that, 
yeah. your own your own singing seems to just open up and um I've been very lucky that that has happened for me like I've been no I haven't been thinking about uh, I've I'd say in the last maybe well before covid I was gigging a lot like I've been very lucky that I I've been gigging professionally since I was 15 but even back then like when I was up until the age of maybe 22 I was always trying to do this and emulate this and copy this it's only been from kind of 22 now to where I am now that I've been like, actually, I'm just going to do what feels right to me. Um, and for me, as well, like, when you're saying you've been gigging, is that just playing the pubs, doing cover songs, like yeah. you know, entertaining the, the punters? But, I mean, I, I do the same thing. And, yeah. you know, it's amazing how better you become or more comfortable you become at playing the guitar and singing. Wait, see, when you're just playing other cover songs but you do it over and over and over yeah it almost is like you realize what your own ability is Find definitely definitely and like i think it kind of sinks in with you know the nights that you get that are really really good and like yeah. everyone's loving it i think those nights do something wonderful for you because you kind of save those and you're you're playing. You're like, oh, I remember the playing that, and I know that if I hit this chord at this time, and or I make a kind of show of this moment, you yeah. kind of get a a lift, and you feel so much better about yourself. Um, so like, they, it definitely does do something for your playing. Do you know what I mean? Like, even confidence is really important. I find in in playing, like, and that doesn't mean that you have to play in complicated stuff. No. But just being confident and playing it, like uh, even if something like if you think of if you were to take something off the top of your head, like if you think of that, think of Folsom Prison Blues and that down 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 down. Like if you're doesn't matter where you are, if you're confident in playing that, you'll get the whole place to lift. But if you're scared to play it, and you're like dang, dang, and you miss it, then you automatically know, everybody kind of goes, "Oh, what's going on here?" I mean, the other thing I've said to people. You know, if I, I'm I'm still playing playing the pubs just now, so I'll be playing. You know what it, what it's like. It'll be nine till twelve. You'll do three hours, and you do you three know, hours. Yeah, that's great. Cool. Over here, it's two. Oh no, it's it's three hours in Scotland. So um, I don't generally take a break because you know I just I would rather just keep playing. So I'm probably playing about forty five songs. Oh, easy. A night and. The people when I'm talking to people about it, and I'm saying, see the amount of times that you know I'll play a wrong chord or I'll forget what I'm playing, but you keep playing. I said you can get away with so much for just being confident. Yeah, <laughs> and then, uh, you notice it when people aren't confident. Yeah, it, it shows. But you know you can get away with anything with a bit of confidence. Oh, definitely. Like it's um, it's different here now. So here would be, here's two hour slots, but I would do like, I would do maybe six hours gig in a day. So I would do three, two hours. Right, okay. Um, so that set might be repeated, you know, not, no, I don't have a, I don't have a, a structured set. Yeah, yeah. Ever, ever. I always start with the same song and that's just yeah. because that but allows me to fix I use basically my gigging setup as vocal guitar and one of the Roland SPD stomps I, I think we've got the exact same setup because I'm exactly the same and you know I don't have a set list I've, I've yeah. got may maybe 200 songs that I can choose between so I don't have to keep playing the same thing over and over yeah. but I, I generally I'll start with the, the first two songs are always the same because yeah. I know that it's Easy to play. It's it's easy on my voice, so it helps to warm it up. But yeah. I, I I just wait and see, you know, what the pub want. I'm exactly the same. But I always play. Um, normally the first two I'll always play, which are which first one is Tom Petty's Free Fallen, okay. and the only reason I do that is because there's enough gap in the guitar that if you need to reach down to the mixer and change a level, yeah, you can. Um, so like you can pull your stomp back, or pull your guitar back, or pull your vocal yeah. back. And then the next one I always do then, obviously it can change, but nor the, normally if I'm gigging in like Northern Ireland and stuff, I'll always do um, Chasing Cars with Snow Patrol and I'll do it as a, a medley and to um, open your eyes by um, 
the Snow Patrol as well. But you can always tell because if if the crowd start kind of singing along with those first three songs, mm-hmm. then you have them for the rest of the gig, and then that's how my set list kind of be determined. But if they don't take on the first three songs, then I'll lay back for a while and be like, right, I'll let you come to me, and then. It's funny that you say that. My my first two songs, I always start with Elvis, Burn in Love. Yeah. It's so simple, but it's a good way to check all your levels are correct yeah. and uh, and just warm your voice up. It's not too too difficult to sing. And then it's all I always go into Losing My Religion by R.E.M. Oh, yeah. yeah. After that, it's um, you know I'll just play whatever. Yeah. No, I think it's I think as well like. It depends where you are, um, like at what level you're at. I think if you're, obviously there are wedding bands and stuff that have a, a set structure, especially when yeah. you're a band and you have, um, like, enter, what is it, what sort of, or, uh, I can't think of the word off the top of my head. Basically, I've, been, well, I've, I've got friends that, that play in wedding bands and I've had a couple of them on previous episodes. Yeah. But he also plays the pubs as well, yeah. okay, but the time. And I've said to him, you know, a lot of the songs that you play at a wedding are the same songs that you play in the pub. So what is the difference? Because you're obviously playing them. I've been, you know, as he said, the main difference is money. But yeah. what it was, he's playing in a wedding band. They, they'll have, with the exception of the first song, which, you know, will be requested by the, the couple yeah. guests, they will be uh, pretty much playing the same set list because it's, it's a greatest hit set list they know the set list inside out he says in the pub you can't do that you've got to have you know 200 songs that you can, people will come up and request songs you've got to yeah. change out. That, that's the difference you know oh, big time ability wise it's exactly the same yeah no I, that's what I was, uh, the word I was looking for there was transitions so like every every like I have a band as well um and we're kind of like an Irish folk band, but we have the same. We have a fairly structured, you know, we have an hour set, an hour, a 90-minute set, and a two-hour set. Yeah. And basically, within those sets, there are set songs that always go together because either the key changes work to get into the next section or whatever. Or and But that's like that's the thing. When you're doing the one-piece stuff, you don't have that. It is just a matter of, like, someone, like, you could be... I don't know what it's like over there with you as well, but you might have the crowd eating out of the palm of your hand, like, yeah. and the place could be going really lively, and then someone will come up and be like, can you play Fields of Gold? And you're like, what? We ha- we were just after doing Don't Look Back in Anger, and now you want to do Fields yeah. of Gold? But the thing is, a lot of the time when everybody's in the right headspace and in good form, it doesn't matter because they'll be like, oh, you'll remember me, and they'll just take that to well. The, the pub gigs is a funny one because... the. You, as you say, you'll be you'll be building it, and if you've got the crowd on your side, you're building it, and you know that if you do this next song, you know they're singing along. So let's do this next song, this next song, and it's exactly what you said there. You'll get someone that will come up, and they'll either ask for a song that it'll be a good song, but nobody else in the pub will have heard it before, so um, I can't play it because yeah. you know, just kill the mood, or it'll be like you've got people dancing, singing along, and and you want me to play something that's like a funeral song, something that's super slow, and you're like, it's the wrong time for it. But yeah. uh, but obviously, that's that's your pub gigs. You do you obviously write your own songs as well, right? Yeah. How do you go about writing a song? So you kind of touched on this a wee bit earlier uh, when we we're talking. So so for example, with myself, see the amount of times, and it's funny you're in a car. The amount of times I'm driving in my car. And I'll be listening to the radio, I'll have music on, I'll have something on. And it's funny because it, there might be a, a five second snippet of the song, there might be a lyric that can inspire in my head an, an entire new song. I can go and write a song and it sounds nothing like the song that inspired it. It's got nothing at all to do with the song that inspired it. But that happens with myself a lot. But with me, it's always, you know a basic sort of skeleton of a song, chords, verse, chorus, the lyrics, I'll have a vocal melody in my head, but the, the mm-hmm. lyrics come last. How do you go about songwriting for yourself? Everyone is different, and that is the God's honest truth. Like Now, that happens to me a lot, where I'll hear a line of a song, and a lot of the times it happens to me that it's not like a line in the song that's important. 
So yeah. do you know, like, do you know, like, there might be a hook of some song. And you're like, it'll be the the line after that that was literally just a filler line, and I'm like, oh, that's that's a cool concept. What if I went? Um, that that happens to me a lot. But the other thing is, then I be so engrossed in the song that I forget to write it down, and then I forget it. And then every time I listen to the song, I'm like, oh, that's that line I said I should have wrote. But the, it does happen sometimes. Um, it definitely, definitely does. It, like, it, it's, it changes it changes drastically. Um, the band I'm in there brought out a single a couple of weeks ago. It's called One More For The Road. I had that chorus of that song for about a year, <laughs> over yeah. a year. And I just, I couldn't, I couldn't write the verses. I just, I didn't know what they were to be and then I played the lads the chorus and they were like oh what if we wrote it about this and the minute I knew what the verses were supposed to be about I had it written yeah. um, but then there are other songs I have like um, some of them come from personal experience and then some of them are like literally just as you say an idea or like uh, something that'll um, something on television something you've read you know yeah read. yeah so like I'm trying to think of um the one I have a song that'll be out, uh, it'll be out shortly now. Actually, um, by the time this releases, and it's a song called "On Our Wedding Day." Um, and I wrote that basically as a wedding gift for two of my best friends. And that was that whole song was written around. It came from a piano riff that I only played because I'm a novice piano player because it's not a complicated <laughs> piano riff. Yeah. Um, so it's funny because I sent that track. Then I actually sent it to County Offaly to a phenomenally talented group of lads, uh, John Byrne and Joe Egan. And the two lads helped me produce the track. And John is a piano player and he he just he writes music and he, he he notates everything to go to orchestras and string pieces and stuff. Yeah. And when you hear an actual piano player play it, it sounds yeah. so much better. But that's where that song came out of. Um, and it was just based around those th- couple of words on our wedding day, so four words. Um, I just wanted that to be the kind of the main thing going throughout it. Um, but I like I've been very fortunate that I've done a fair bit of writing with other writers as well, and it's amazing what you pick up. Yeah. Like it's amazing what you pick up. I remember one guy told me that every time you write a first verse, there's a good chance it's the chorus. All right, okay. So that that really got me. Um, that that'll change your thinking about something. So he's like, yeah, if you think that's your first verse, try it as your chorus. Yeah, I was going to say, maybe I should go back to some songs I've wrote and switch them around and see what happens. That's exactly what, like, that's, we literally did that for a full day. We we had songs that we'd all written. We were like, let's just, what if we change the chorus from this to this and see does it bring the song anywhere? Depends how, depends how people write. I, I'm very much like, I'll write a verse, chorus, bridge, you know, a, a, be, a skeleton of a song. But I, I see the song as, you know, I find it hard to then see it out with that. I had a friend that I used to play in a band with, and he had this ability to say, like, take that bit from that song, and then take that bit from that song, put them together, and then take this. And I, I can't think like that, but he yeah. has, it worked. And some of these ideas worked, some of them didn't, but you, you came up with stuff that you would never have came up with by yourself. Yeah, well, I find I can't be too overstimulated when I write. Um, uh, I've had people send me. I actually did a track there with a DJ, um, and he had written, he he produced the full track. He just wanted the top line over it, and I had to send it back to him. Be like, can you take away loads of the stuff? It's yeah. there's too much going on. So like, I I usually write around the guitar and the piano, um, but I, I I think it's because of the way I kind of learned in school as well. I use mind maps a lot. Um, so basically like uh, to break that down say if I have a song and I kind of have an idea of what I want the song to be about so I don't know if it's cutting the lawn or whatever it is you know what I mean like the song's about cutting the lawn the first verse of that song I write down what I want that to be about so if you were to take it from that basis it's probably opening the shed door and finding the lawnmower and getting the lawnmower ready to go out the second verse is probably about that that walk you do from the lawnmower coming out of the garden until you get it started on yeah. the lawn. I mean, you, you're actually telling. You, I've listened to. I was listening to your songs earlier, and you're telling a, a story. But it, it's very obvious. Like if I if I was to sit and read your lyrics, 
Yeah. Without the music on. Yeah. Tell her a story. I, I know what it is that you're talking about. Yeah. If you were to, to read my lyrics, some of them might be the same, but I think some of them would probably be a, a little bit more vague. Like, you could read it and go, I, I think he's talking about that, but somebody else yeah. might no, no, I think he's talking about that. But that that's songwriting. It, it's definitely yeah. fun. But um, see if we fast forward, I know that you, you joined the band around COVID time. Yeah, yeah. So there's a story of, of you playing and you kind of got discovered because nobody could escape you because of yeah. social distancing. Um, the band Kyo, um, yeah. how long have they been on the go? Were, were they on the go for a while before you joined or were they no. in progress or, or, and? Were they just starting out? No, myself and the four lads are the are the we're the start of it. Um, right. So for anybody that is listening and wants a bit of a backdrop, but just or a bit of context on it, I was gigging and and Oma and um, Nathan Carter, who's a massive massive star over here and over like in Scotland and England as well. Nathan was in um, on a stag do and I was playing in the corner and uh, it was during COVID, so the restrictions were on, so they couldn't get up couldn't dance and they couldn't leave so he came up to me after and asked me if I would be interested he had this idea for a project fast forward now a couple of years later and myself and the lads have been all over the world and we're heading even further all over the world now this next couple of weeks and months so, so um, tell us about the band though because you've got Cahill, Daryl and James is that right? yeah that's it so Cahill plays the accordion uh, James plays the fiddle um, and Daryl is the other guitar player, um, and myself and Daryl will kind of share the the majority of the singing. So, Steve, see, as a band, the four of you together, mm -hmm. do you, do you write songs as a band, or do you come in with maybe a, like a, a skeleton of a song already, a, an idea, and everyone then contributes to it to make it better? How how do you go about doing it? They're, they've they're, we've got three songs released now that well one song I wrote completely on my own um, it's a song called Led Me To You I actually wrote it over Covid and I just played it, we were in the studio one day and I played it to the lads and the producer was like I really like that, I think that could be done really nicely um, obviously to make people understand I had never played traditional Irish music folk yeah. music wasn't really my forte um, and then I just came down and met these lads and I've just kind of delved into it as, as, as hard as I can um, and I love it now do you know I really do love it but then I was going to say if you're, if you're bringing in the song are you showing the other guys and are you trusting them to you know for example did you say it was Cahill that's on the the accordion mm -hmm. yeah so are you saying to him this is kind of what I want you to play or do you trust him to go away and whatever he's going to contribute, you know it is going to make the song sound better, or is that a wee bit of a, a combination of both? Oh, Cahill, Cahill and James are... I, I, are there, I can't say anything other than say they're just phenomenal musicians. Um, yeah. The two lads, the, they're, the brains they have, the, even the connection they have in playing together, it's very, very strange. A lot of the time we'll go into the studio, play something... And the two lads will track at the same time, so they'll be playing at the same time. Well, I was there in the studio recording. Yeah. There's a preferred method in which you use record. So you're saying uh, there's two of them, we'll, we'll do the basic track first. Yeah, so we're basically like, if we, we usually spend a day kind of structuring everything, then yeah. we put the guitars down first. Um, well, actually, this time, the last track we had was our first track with full drum kit, so we put the drum kit down first and then worked off that. But normally, rule of thumb would be acoustics, guide vocal, um, and then the lads will play over that. But it's very, very funny. The lads have a connection, like, and I mean, they can't see each other, so they're in two different booths and they will play exactly the same thing so many times and it's not that they've played these runs or riffs before it's just that they're it's it's almost scary um it sounds like they're just on the same musical page it, they really genuinely are like even sometimes we'll be rehearsing and like do you know if you're rehearsing and there's a bad take and you're like you know you're not going to use it but you use the you, you keep we would record everything on the phone just to kind of have a, an idea of structure yeah. so if there's a bad take if someone hits a bum note we all kind of look at each other and be like right we're not going to use this take but let's just keep the structure right and nine times out of two, ten the two lads will play something 
completely mental at the exact same time. Like the other day, we were in the studio and there's a set that, or there's a take that couldn't be used, and the two lads ended up playing the SpongeBob theme, uh, SpongeBob SquarePants theme tune <laughs> at the exact same time, and it just shows you they're just. It's very, very strange. But then, um, in terms of the songwriting, so one of the songs came completely from me that was written and I had an idea of the structure. The The song we had then, we had their title track of our EP, our debut EP, was a, a track called Those Were The Days. Um, yep. And that track, actually, Joe Egan and John Byrne had, they had kind of recorded a track Um and it just worked out that it was in the key of D, which was a key that suited us to sing in. And I sat down and I basically just asked the lads. For some reason, I had this hook in my head with just like the, the, the lyric in my head was, or was those were the days. So I was just like, right, lads, I want you to tell me about your childhoods. Like I was just like, write mm-hmm. down. So basically I got the three other lads to write down and there's no chronological order, just anything they remembered. It doesn't have to be a memory. It could have just been a smell an experience, a, a t-shirt, a color, anything. And um, I basically got them to write, write that down. Are you, uh, when it comes to writing original songs with the band, is everyone contributing lyric wise or do you just stick to one person? No, we all, we would all, um, we would all contribute. Um, it just depends then on what kind of fits yeah. uh, in terms of syllables and stuff or like into the, into the melody. Um, or like we might, for example, like in the, it's also very interesting because of the band, we're from different parts of the country. So Cahill is from Dublin, James is from Wexford, Daryl's from Kildare and I am from Donegal. So in our last track, um, one of the lyrics that I had written was when the lights go down in a little town, the fiddle seems to play a sweeter tune. So little and fiddle were the kind of words that I was playing off each other, but because of Daryl's accent, they couldn't record. It couldn't record it because it just it just didn't work. It just sounded like mumbo jumbo. So we had yeah. to change to when the lights go down in this old town, the fiddle seems to play a sweeter tune because Daryl's got such a a bright voice and like a like a very well pronounced voice where mine just kind of huskier, so it kind of worked. Ah. You should try recording in Scotland when you've got this accent. <laughs> uh, but funny, we have um, we listen to a lot of Scottish music, um, like loads of it. Um, and we were where did we met the lads. We met one of the lads from is it Trail West. Trail West, yeah. We met one of the lads. We were playing in Glasgow, and one of the guys was there. Um, and we just we couldn't believe it was him because we were, we listened to them flat out all the time. Yeah. Um, and like a lot of the tunes that we would play in our, uh, like the traditional tunes that we would play in the, our set are Scottish tunes because they're just fantastic tunes. Um, so we have a close, and then we also recorded um, Walking on the Waves as well, which yeah. is obviously a massive Scottish song as well. And um, one of those ones just, we we heard it in, I think we were in Edinburgh and we were just in a bar and the guy started playing it and I was like, that is phenomenal. Um, yeah, but, uh, I, I play that. The band I'm in, we, we recorded a version of it as well. It's just one of those songs, um, you know, Skipnish. You've got Tide Lines, obviously, from the uh, yeah. second band that Robert had started. But uh, here's a question for you You obviously have done songwriting and recording, mm-hmm. you've done performing. If you had to just pick one to do, Ooh. which one do you think you would pick? If you could only choose one, that's a tough one. Now. <laughs> when I was when I was younger, I would have said nothing would be the performing. Um, but now that I'm a little bit older and I kind of see the amount of travelling and and how hard it can be to kind of have a normal life with it, I would love to get to the position where I could just wake up in the morning, have a brief, and write a song all day, setting it away. And then yeah. start again the next day. So that's just where I'm at at the moment. But now, come to say that we're about to hit festival season now here in Ireland. And I know, like, it starts this weekend. So I know that, ask me again on Monday. And I'll be like, nah, I'd never give up playing. Never. Well, here's a question. You, you said that you're late 20s. Mm-hmm. I am in my 40s. So there's a bit of an age difference. So when I was younger, you would um, you would go into the into the, the shops 
you know, you go to the music shop when you still had them before they all yeah. closed down. And, you know, you didn't have the internet, so you could be flipping through the CDs. And you might purchase something purely based on the, the album cover. You know, this is a mm-hmm. cool looking album cover. I'm going to buy this. Hopefully when you get home and you pop it into the CD player, that it's a, a worthwhile purchase. Yeah. Nowadays, you know, the way that music is accessed, you've got streaming, you've got downloading. Do you think the artwork side of it is still as important? I think it depends on the genre. And possibly the age range, I would have thought maybe. Yeah, yeah. I think um, I think like indie music kind of indie music would kind of be one that would stick to my brain about like how important the artwork would be. Um, whereas what I do and the kind of singer songwriter kind of thing, the general rule of thumb that I would have kind of thought about is just it's a photo of the artist because you want people to associate you with the song and if they ever saw you out. Um, yeah. I don't know. I think now, like social media is such a big, a big thing. Like, I don't know. I, I'm also one of those people that can't draw. So art for me has always been a format that I just never truly understood. Um, it's funny. It's one, it is one of those questions that you ask people. Some people th- think it's as important as the music. It's just as important. Yeah. There's other people I've spoke to who almost think it's irrelevant. I think if I was to if I was to have a definitive point on that, I would think the artist's image is much more important than the music's image. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense. So, like that can be from the artist's social media or how they dress or what they do in the gig. In terms of the actual artwork on, and you know yourself now, like everything's singles now. Very few people are releasing albums. So, like if you don't really like what you did for your last artwork, you have. 11 other chances to try yeah. something new anyway. So I think maybe the artwork is less important. But again, it is down to the genre of music. I, I would fully believe in that. So Matthew, we're obviously still in, in the first half of 2024. So what is the plans for the remainder of the year for yourself? So I have uh, a single coming out now on the 26th um, of... What month are we on now? Me. <laughs> May, so the 26th, I, t- I honestly, that's not a joke. I'm terrible with the months of the year. So I have a song coming out on the 26th of June. Um, yep. And my aim is going to be to get at least two more out after that. But is this your own solo stuff or is this with the band? This is my own solo stuff now. So um, the I actually, I wrote another song for the band that um, I'm going to, we're, we're actually demoed it. The two lads, Carl and James, sent me back the demos of the accordion and fiddle takes today. So I haven't been home, as I was saying, the car broke down. So I'm hoping to get into my home studio on Friday, kind of get that put together. And then I'll bring that to the the lads and the management as a, a project and, be, and see what we think. Everything we've done up to this, up to date has been kind of lively. This one is, it's a song called Home Again. And, um, it's more about, it's kind of like an anti-immigration song. I don't know what it's like for yourselves over there, but over here, everyone has moved to Australia or America or wherever. Um, and I basically wanted to write a song for those that haven't gone, you know, that, that always wanted to go. But like myself, I always thought maybe heading away would be a good thing. But I had such a good career here and ties and so much love for Ireland that I was like, actually, do you know, if I went anywhere, I would just want to be home again. So, um, so that's kind of the plan. So I have... I have kind of four, three or four structured releases after this one. I definitely have two. If I can hit the four, I will. Um, and then the main plan is we're, we're gigging a lot. The band are very lucky. We're, we're away now. We're gigging pretty much all summer. And then we head to Greece for a week. And then we head to Spain for a week. And then we head to America for a week just before Christmas. Um, and then I've just, I literally was just, I'm waiting on a phone call back here now to see if I can go to Dubai for a week in December just for a one piece gig and you know, but I've, somewhere I've always wanted to go. So I'd like to see that as well. It sounds like you're extremely busy. Um, but uh, up to this point, Matthew, we have been um, quite serious talking about uh, all the different aspects of music, songwriting and all that. So before we finish things, I'm going to ask you some fun questions. Go for it. Go for it. I love a fun question. So. Imagine you could go back in time mm-hmm. 
anywhere in the world, what is the one gig, small gig, big concert, you decide, what is the one gig that you wish that you could have attended to witness it? I always said, I always said I would have loved to have seen Michael Jackson. It wouldn't have mattered where. Yeah. I just would have loved to have seen it because it's such a... Um, iconic. It, it's iconic, but it's also like the pageantry, the show, the everything about it is something that I wish I had seen. Do you know what I mean? I'm going to make you jealous because I did actually see him. Oh, raging. I think it was, uh, it was either 1990 or... 91, mm-hmm. like that. He, he played at Glasgow Green, Phenomenal. Uh, outdoor gig, and obviously I was just young at the time, but it, you know, it's still, it, it wasn't a concert, it was it was a show, it was yeah. just uh, phenomenal, and you know, it was just on a different level, you know, it, it wasn't even just a music gig, it, it was like a, a, the whole thing was a show, it was it was crazy. That's what I mean. I would have loved to experience, like, even the fans, you know, like that whole, I don't think we'll see that again. Um, I, honestly, I don't think we'll ever see that again. Maybe One Direction was probably the closest thing that ever came to it and my, you know, t- to that level of, like, super fan. What about um, yourself? Hey? <laughs> what about yourselves? Uh, well, hope, hope to God, if, <laughs> if the traditional Irish music takes a... Takes a a surplus now, hopefully it'll be us. But I do think, like, to, to see people that level, like, people that fainted when they saw them, and even, just, I know it sounds crazy, but just to witness that would be, you'd always look back and go, like, that was crazy. Do you know what I mean? That was mad. Well, here's another question for you. As you know, there is, over the years, millions and millions of amazing, great songs that have been written and recorded by different artists. What's the one song that you wish you could have been sat at the control desk to witness it being recorded in the studio? I'm going to give you two for this. Um, number one, I would have loved to seen. I would have loved to, just because you said you painted the scene about being in the production room for it, I would have loved to have been there when they were putting together um, Sir Duke, Stevie Wonder, Sir Duke, because I just think even like lyrically and stuff, I, I that song amazes me just the way it, what it's written about and stuff. Um, that would have been, and that's obviously so happy and so groovy and stuff. That would have been phenomenal. The other one is, it's the same. People always ask me what's a song that I wish I had written, and yeah. I always say um, it's a song. That I don't know if it's if he wrote it or not, but it was a song I heard by Hal Ketchum called "Satisfied Mind," right. and it's just. Oh, the lyrics and it would make your heart break. It's just, and it's just such a simple, simple message. Um, like he, uh, he said the, the one of the lines is, and there's so many lines in it that are fantastic. But he says, um, "Don't look into the darkness if you want to see true black. Um, look into a morning's brightness when love ain't coming back." Like just uh, often. Yeah, but- you almost get jealous, like, why can I not write something as cool but as, as effective as it that? It really, it annoys me every single every single time I write a song. I'm like, yeah, but it's no satisfied minds. So I'm like, oh, <laughs> just, I need, it's like my white whale. I just need to do something like that. But that one, that is one of, in my opinion, that's one of the best songs ever written. I'm putting your uh, band me- fellow band members on the spot now. Right. Um... This might turn out bad for one of them, right? Right, but okay. Imagine it's four o'clock in the morning. Mm-hmm. You've got a dead body in the boot of your car. Right. You need to dispose of that body. You need help, and it, there's got to be no questions asked. Yeah. Cahill, Daryl, James, which one of them are you phoning to help you? Don't even. I don't even have to think about it. I, I know straight away, James. So this is scary because the amount of band members I ask this question to and they automatically know exactly who in the band it's going to be. Why James? <laughs> he just knows so much about everything. He is like, he just has a knowledge on everything. Like we'll be, and I'm not joking, we'll be sitting like and a car will drive past us and he'll be like, lads, 
just so you know, that engine's not a normal engine. That engine was actually made in 16 parts and put together by one man. And you're like, how do you know that? And he's like, I just love watching stuff. So that's why I would pick James. It's not because he's given me a serial killer vibe. It's just he just knows so much about stuff. No, that's fine. We'll go with that. And then the last question, uh, Mount Rushmore. Who is your four musicians or bands at the top of the pile for yourself? Who... who whether it be songwriting, whether it be performing, whether it be the overall package, who are the four at the top of your list for yourself are just perfect? That's tough. I would say number one would be Willie Nelson because I just think for someone to have a career that spanned that long and to have songs that literally can do everything, um, Willie Nelson is up there. Um Oh, this isn't. This is a tough one. I'm. I'm gonna. I'm actually just gonna come put straight out now and just say my dad as well because dad's dad songwriting has been such a personal thing to me my whole life that I've seen it. Yeah. I've seen the songs from both sides, you know. Um, so that'd be one more. Um, there's a guy. Oh, this is incredibly difficult. Um, <laughs> In terms of an artist, like I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to who I mentioned earlier on. Um, or am I? Am I not? I've only, I've only got four. Four, and you've done two already. Oh, that is so difficult. Um, Dolly Parton. Dolly Parton has to be there. Dolly is just uh, iconic. Do you know what I mean? I was gonna say. I was going to say Taylor Swift, but Dolly Parton's the, the OG Taylor Swift, so I'll say... you got one more? Dolly Parton. And then... I'm probably going to say... I th- I'm, I'm going to go back to... I think Stevie Wonder is... Um, in terms of everything, singer, musician, songwriter, um, he is iconically strong in all four or all three segments you know um, and he's had a fantastic career and like um, y- you it's don't even a, have to I was going to say it's a great last question because you are the 35th guest that I've had on mm-hmm. and nobody gives the same answer and regardless of, of the style of music that you are known for that you create yeah. does not determine who you pick so yeah. uh, but it's so interesting to hear other people, and and you get you do get a different answer every single time. It's amazing. Yeah, no, that's a, that. I'm gonna save that one and ask the lads that now when I get them because I think um, I, I'm quite happy with those four. I think um, obviously no, maybe not many, not people will, or not many people will know Shuni or my dad. But for anybody that does go and check them out, you'll kind of see what I mean. That the songs are kind of. Uh, the songs have been there through my whole life and then the other ones like I think Willie Nelson every like Blue Eyes Crying in the Rain or all these fantastic songs Dolly Parton I Will Always Love You is going to be iconic and then Stevie Wonder sure you could pick any one of his yeah Matthew uh, it's been a pleasure to speak to you Uh, thank you learned so much I'm uh, I'm glad that we managed to get some time put aside to do this but I do uh, I wish you all the luck in the future just for your solo stuff and with the band uh, if you're ever over in Glasgow uh, or Scotland, give me a wee shout. But uh, for anybody looking for tickets or that, go on the band's website. You'll get all the information there. You've got the band's social media as well. So yeah. check us out. But uh, it's been a pleasure speaking to you, and I wish you all the success in the future. And thank you very much for having me. I was, uh, I'm not lying, I was a wee bit nervous about coming on here and thinking about talking about songs and writing and stuff, but you know what? I'm glad that it's it's been fantastic. So I hope everybody that's listening enjoys it as well. That's great. Thanks, Matthew. Cheers. Cheers, man. See you later. Cheers.